Well, good afternoon. Well, it's good to have all of you back for this last session for today. It's been a long day, and um, this session is a little bit different. We'll be talking about the founders of uh, the philanthropic organizations that we have on stage here. So I'm, what I'm going to do is I'm going to first introduce the three of them so you have some background of their organizations and the family philanthropy, and then we'll go into the questions. And I hear we have a longer um, Q&A session, so that's also good news because the bus are leaving a little bit later. So um, Melissa Berman is president and CEO of the Rockefeller Philanthropy Advisors, which we uh, call RPA, right? And it traces back to its antecedent to John D. Rockefeller Sr., who in 1891 began to professionally, professionally manage his philanthropy as if it were a business back in 1981, uh, 1891, with thoughtful and effective philanthropy as its one and only mission. So it rings a bell, right? It's like venture, they didn't have the word venture philanthropy in those days. But actually, if you read the early, um, early writings, it's actually called scientific philanthropy. They came up, they coined this word, word scientific philanthropy. But they were already thinking like what we are doing right now back in 1891. So for RPA as a non-profit organization, and it operates separately from the Rockefeller Foundation. So RPA actually counsels on charitable giving, develops philanthropic programs, and offers complete program administrative and management services for foundations and trusts. RPA also operates a chari charitable giving fund through which clients can make gifts outside of the United States participate in funding consortia and operate non-profit initiatives. So Melissa, we will be very excited to learn more about RPA's work soon uh, from your diverse pool of donors also. Now to Kyung San. Kyung San is the founder of Root Impact and he has the belief that everyone has the will and potential to improve the world. The name of your organization, Kyung San, Root Impact, is carefully chosen to convey the aspiration to become a root of impact as well as a root for impact. That is, you are the foundation of the social impact sector like a solid root. Root impact makes possible an ecosystem where everyone is empowered to contribute to solving social issues in their own way. Root Impact is already inspiring changes in the culture, culture of charitable giving through the creative and passion of young people in Korea. Typically, you catalyst social change by initiating social programs and supporting social innovators, for example, Impact Base Camp and Project Aspen. You are, also leading a, you are also a leading force promoting philanthropy in Korea, spearheading partnerships with other global organizations, including founding Ashoka Korea. You are truly the root of impact and root for impact in Korea. And we will hear more about it soon. So now we come to Lawrence. <laughs> Apart from his being founder and chairman of what you have heard this morning, um, the Asia Philanthropic, Philanthropic Circle, APC, right? Lawrence also wears another hat. He is the chairman of Lian Foundation, an organization that walks the talk with radical philanthropy. Your foundation leverages technology and pioneer novel solutions, most notably programs like Death and Dying for Elder Care, Lian Aid for Water and Sanitation, and in the last couple of years, you advocated and rallied both public and private providers to operate with an inclusive mindset in Singapore's preschool sector. Lian Foundation has proven that disruptive radical philanthropy is possible in Asia by spearheading strategic partnerships, pushing boundaries to fill critical gaps, empowering people, and stimulating idea exchanges, collaboration, and value creation. So more recently, you have launched the Asia Philanthropy Circle, a donor platform that aims to build a distinctively Asian model of philanthropy that focuses on action and impact. And we heard some this morning, and I hope you'll share more about it. So now to all each of you, I will ask the opening question and I'll give them each a chance to respond as long as, you, as, long as possible. 
so for each of you, the origins of your family philanthropy or your philanthropic organizations came from a founder who had great vision, aspiration, and commitment to use the vast resources they had to create tremendous public good, create opportunities, and transform lives. They were certainly disruptors of their day. And within cycles of philanthropic innovation, they also played a sustaining role. They were truly social entrepreneurs ahead of their times. Can you bring us closer to your founders and share with us what they were like as disruptors, sustainers, and the philanthropic legacy that is so enduring and warm in our hearts? So may I start with Melissa? Um, thank you. Um, it's a pleasure to be here, and I'm very grateful to ABPN for the opportunity to be part of this important event. So we have been talking about the future for the last uh, day or so here, so let me take you back to the 19th century for a very brief visit. Um, in the mid-19th century, John D. Rockefeller was born in upstate New York. He eventually found himself in the Midwestern part of the United States, in an era when a very new technology was emerging called petroleum. And he began to understand what the potential of that was. He was already working full time um, as a sort of bookkeeper. Um, he left school at the age of around 16 or 17 to help support his family. And he was a very astute student of business and in some ways helped create what we think of as the modern uh, multi-billion dollar corporation. Um, he perceived what the uses of petroleum might be, and he also understood what the power of a large organization might be to harness that. The methods that he used to create what became Standard Oil are now generally viewed as um, a combination of legitimate and perhaps less legitimate business practices. He was very hard-nosed. He was very financially oriented. He kept careful ledgers of every penny that he spent. And although he was a very hard-nosed, aggressive business person, he was raised in a very religious household and he was taught from an early age to give at least 10% of his income to charity. And he began to do that the minute he began to work full time, even though he was actually relatively poor. Um, initially, he gave mostly to uh, Baptist organizations across the US, including for some of the work that they did outside the US. And eventually, he came to amass a fortune that today is rivaled by very few people on the planet. And I think what's important to understand is even though the adjusted dollar amount of his wealth is not that different from many of the wealthiest people on the planet now, the level of power that John D. Rockefeller had is unprecedented compared to the power that wealth holders have now because the size of the economy, at least in the United States and certainly in other places in the world, was so much smaller, and the size of the public sector was so much smaller, and the freedom to operate, because there were no systems in place and very few checks and balances, was also unparalleled. So he was able to exert much more influence than, all, than any other philanthropist who's living today. Um, he was very much of a systems thinker and an organization builder. And in his era, systems, systems and large, complex organizations were extremely disruptive. He took what had essentially been a cottage industry and created the modern corporation. He was married to a woman who was herself extremely disruptive and whose history and role in philanthropy is also very important. He married a woman named Laura Spellman. Those of you who know the uh, US education system may recognize the name of Spellman College in Atlanta, which remains the preeminent institution of higher learning in the US uh, specifically designed for African-American women. 
Laura Spellman was the daughter of abolitionists. They were very active in the anti-slavery movement. And she carried that forward with a belief that African Americans should have opportunities for education. At the time, that was a very disruptive and radical point of view. She was also very committed to the movement to eliminate alcohol in the United States. And in fact, she participated in events which were not only disruptive, but were actually violent. She was part of the groups of women who would go into bars and saloons with axes and start breaking up the bar and breaking up the bottles and getting themselves arrested in acts of what they thought of as civil disobedience and which we now view as perhaps a little overenthusiastic. <laughs> But the, this legacy of a radical sense of uh, social justice and of making the economy work for everyone, um, a deep religious faith and a commitment to building the systems to make change happen is what made John Dee and Laura Rockefeller such a disruptive philanthropists in their era. Very good. How about we put the same question for Kyung San, your grandfather? <laughs> yes. Um, my grandfather, Chong Ju Young, he started this whole Hyundai conglomerate at the time. So now Hyundai become this car company, automobile, uh, the heavy industry, the construction, and everything. But at that time, I believe my grandfather was a little bit more disruptive than other big founder of the conglomerates because. When you look into that, most of the lo other large conglomerates found there, they were a son of the big landlord at the time. So they were well educated and then they had money. So when they wanted to start business, they just asked Papa, could you give me money to buy this factory building? <laughs> <laughs> but my grandfather, Chong Ju Young, he was son of a very poor farmer and he just cannot stand being poor for a long time. So he started to escape his family for four times, failed three times. And actually, at the third time, he stole the money from his father that he father make it through selling his only cow, which means it was vast amount of their family wealth. So I guess he was being a little bit too disruptive at the time for their family. <laughs> and then he started all his business uh, just after educated only the elementary school. And he's just keep trying to make it not that poor anymore. So he has this kind of very, I don't know, urgency, I guess. But he, after being successful and everything, I mean, at that time, it was, there are a lot of uh, opportunity after this 36 years of colonized country. And after that, we have this four years of war, which is really uh, devastating. But that also means there are literally blank space here and there everywhere. So he, he started his business. But I guess the important part was he kept maintaining his philosophy and spirit of, I want to escape this poverty. And it means not only me, but also this my fellow people and all of this country. I want this country to be prosperous. So he always said that after a certain kind of time, and even though he become billionaire, he always said, I'm not capitalist. I'm not wealth holder. I'm just labor worker who happened to be rich and lucky. So he always wanted to focus on the industry and business that is actually helpful for this country that creates lots of jobs and then make this country much more larger. So rather than retail, he originally uh, focused on retail, uh, no, not the retail, sorry, the heavy industry and construction that is actually making infrastructure for the people. So. Uh, so he started building apartment for the country, he built a highway for the country, and he built the bridges for the country, and this and that everywhere. And I think this is a private story, so I'm not sure this is strong or not. And uh, he asked their family to not go into uh, loan business, because actually it's ripping off the poor people. So he believes this kind of spirit. And then he, in some sense, he was truly socially entrepreneur at that time. And then after that, I guess another important part is being, uh, the reason he was being able to disrupt it because he realized he doesn't know everything. He, the, he uh, how should I say? 
acknowledged he is not that educated like other people. So his uh, strength is becoming like being much more reckless, I guess. So his famous quotation is, hey, have you ever done it? So when all the other scholar people, when all the other educated people, it's just simply not able to work. It's just not working. He just tried it and he makes it happen. I guess that's how he become disruptive and then that's how he become socially entrepreneurs in his sense. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Oh, Lawrence, let me share, Lien Ying Charles. So my, my grandfather is Lien Ying Chao, <clears throat> born 1906, was orphaned in 1919. Um, but before his father died, he told my grandfather, um, you make it good in a place which is surrounded by water. Now go and seek that place. So the first place that he went to, not Singapore, was Hong Kong. <laughs> <clears throat> but he found that that is not the right place. You know, somehow it didn't feel right. So his uncle, who had come to Singapore, went back to Hong Kong to bring him to Singapore. Uh, and he arrived on a boat with just a few coins in his pocket. So no cows to, to sell. To, you know, <laughs> no, fa no family to run away from. <laughs> 14 years old, right? He was 14 years, 14 years, old. years old. And, you know, back then when you arrive in the Singapore River, you, you arrive in a boat, the first thing you do is you ask, you know, where are the people like you? you it goes, Teochew. Where are the Teochew people in Singapore? You know, they're all in Chinatown, but they all have different parts of, you know, they, they, they occupy different streets, different mm -hmm. shop houses. And he went there, and he was taken care of by the Teochew community got a job, got educated because he had really very little formal education. And he remembered that. You know, he remembered the education I mean the opportunities that was given by a community who were strangers to him. And for him giving back was very important because he was given so much. And education, sponsoring education was really critical because he was given so much. Um, so he, he worked very hard and he did very well. Uh, he had an incredible boss who increased his wages. He, he started sweeping the floor and becoming a shop assistant. He increased his wages, uh, from very, of course, from a very low base. His wages doubled every year by, by this incredible boss. And the boss said, at some point said, well, you have to go set up your own business mm -hmm. because you're wasting your time with me. Um, and he did, encouraged by the boss to do that. Um, and he didn't look back ever since. And just looking back at, you know, I, he was really very old when I was a teenager. So I didn't, I, 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 mean, I, I learned things from him and through the family. But a lot of it I also read, because he, uh, he gave 13 hours of oral transcripts to the National Archives. And actually, I only quite recently read through all the, all the transcripts. Um, and that generation had something special. You know, they had a certain sense of owning the community and doing things for the community instinctively. So, for example, when, um, when we had the, the war, the Second World War, 1942, I mean, there's lots of there's late daily bombing of Singapore by the Japanese planes before the Japanese came over the causeway. Um, and the Chinese businessman back then, my grandfather was a very young president of the Chinese Chamber of Commerce, only 36 years old. Huh. Um, but the Chinese businessmen would, every morning, they'll they come together and they'll say, well, and nobody asked them to. Mm. They said, we have the resources to do this. We come together. You know, what places got bombed? What places need re uh, reconstruction you know, to, to patch up? You send your resources there. I send my resources here. Every morning. I yeah. mean, that's completely yeah. amazing, right? You know, that, that generation just took it upon themselves to just do things without being told. And I think we have lost some of that. So that is, I think, the beginnings of the philanthropic spirit. It's not just about giving money. It's about taking ownership of social problems and fixing it, you know, without people telling you what to do, right? Yeah. Without even people giving you permission. Um, during the war, a lot, of, a lot of them fled. I mean, otherwise they would have been assassinated by the Japanese army to, to China. So they went to China. He set up an overseas Chinese bank in China, in Chongqing, the, the wartime capital. Um, back then, it was for remittances of all, all these exiled Chinese to back to their home countries. 
but also to, to send messages to and fro the love to, to their loved ones. So that's again some you know uh, thinking out of the box. Say what can you do? You know you you marry two things together: banking and remittances, <laughs> and you know our modern versions of email. You know. Uh, <laughs> So they can communicate to your loved ones uh, in one service in one company, and he did. He had such a great experience there. He brought, he came back and he set up a bank, and uh, and that's how the overseas union banks uh, started. And he created as well. But he never, he always continued to give because I think there's a saying that it goes. I mean, my grandfather didn't come up with this saying, but. Uh, that if you don't give when you are poor, you never give when you are rich. You know? um, <coughs> yeah. And I, and I truly believe it. You know, and he, giving was always a, a part of his life. But it's not just the giving; it's being the community leader. I mean, in the 50s, uh, the Chinese um, schooling for Chinese-speaking people was very d difficult because there were there weren't good schools. Mm. There wasn't a university for them. So they came together in the 50s, as, and you know the yeah, story because yes, you're yes. from NTU. Right, right. Yeah. Um, the Chinese businessmen and came, well, we'll build a new university, Nanyang University for the Chinese speaking population. Uh, what was also amazing about that is that it's not just a few people doing it. The entire Chinese speaking community, you know the story probably right, better, right. came together to contribute. You now, there's a campaign, for example, one day's wages from every single Chinese. Mm -hmm. To contribute to the building right. of the new universe, even the bargos, you know, and yeah. the trishaw, rickshaw pullers mm -hmm. contributed the one yeah. day's wages. The hawkers right. gave the one day's wages. This is community building, you know, and and, and again, crowdfunding, crowdfunding, crowdfunding. crowdfunding. <laughs> crowdfunding. <laughs> in those days, in 1950, can you yeah. imagine? They didn't have an online platform, but they could mobilize every single person to contribute a day's wages. How yeah. did we do that? Yeah. So this this is disruptive, right? Yes. You yes. know, uh, and and we're only gaining. We have got all the tools, and yet we struggle. With right. It. Uh, so he he also built uh, helped build a Nian College, which became a, a, a Nian Polytechnic. It's not so easy, you know, building a college. Yeah. He got he had no money. And this is in the he midst no of colonial times. Okay? <laughs> so, uh, but Nian Kongsi, you know, which he was a chairman of, yeah. you know, they had land, but uh, unfortunately on the land, if you if you uh, go to Orchard Road, there's a Nian built, uh, city, right? That was part of the land that they had. Mm. Mandarin was part of the land they had, mm -hmm. but they had all these orchards. That's why it's called Orchard Road, right? Mm -hmm. all, the, all these orchards mm -hmm. you know, t had taken over all that land and they had to be persuaded to move. Tell us you know? about so the, the, the foundation that he, okay. he, he took it upon himself okay. to create mm -hmm. that okay. foundation. So uh, okay, let, let's quickly move on. But anyway, he, uh, just to finish the story, he he, he persuaded all those orchard people to move to Adam Road, which is why he got all those uh, yeah. flat, uh, uh, nurseries there, right. and used the rented out the land and built Nyan mm -hmm. College. It came 1980. He created his the Lian Foundation, gave 48 percent of his wealth to the foundation. Um, he copied Lee Conchian. 48 percent. 48 percent. He copied Lee Conchian. Yeah. Uh, who, who set up Lee, Lee Foundation in, in the 1950s. I mean, Lee, Lee Conchian was much more senior than him. But Lee Conchian had looked at Rockefeller and <laughs> the big foundations in the US and copied from them. <laughs> so the disruption that happened in the US you know, also made its way to mm -hmm. uh, the, the shores here, in, uh, yeah. in, to, to Singapore. Yeah. And, right, and right. the early founders also copied the disruption, I mean, uh, okay. sustained the disruption that started in the US. Yeah. Um, and well, that's the fantastic. You know, that's, that's the founding of. Thank of you, Indonesia. Lawrence. Thanks. Um, it, th mm -hmm. We heard these stories that are so touching, and this is back in the days where before they had had a VPN to learn from. You know, they rallied among themselves, and for the story that Lawrence just told us about, the entire Chinese community came together without any big meetings. You know, they were the ones who made the meeting, and I see Mr. Chua Tian Po here, who is from the Hokkien Hui Kuan and Singapore Chinese Federation of uh, Clans. Um, they saw the need to do something. They came together and collaborated. They didn't sort of say, wow, we can't work with this, we can't work with it. They worked together even when they could work together because there was a cause. We, I, I think this session brings up these stories because they walked the path. They were so courageous, so brave. What can we learn from them? They didn't have a really easy time too. 
they were in the midst of colonial society, but they still found the strength. And I think we need to find that strength amongst our social entrepreneurs today. They were social entrepreneurs. There was not that language at that time, but can you see the similarity? Even at Rockefeller's time, they were talking about scientific philanthropy already. So I think um, we, sometimes if you come to the point where you get very tired and this is so difficult and we can't get through, think of the people before us who have walked this path. I think they will give us inspiration. And now I'd like to pose the second question. Um, we have two questions here. What was your role as collaborators to build social change in their times? What can we learn from them? And how do we see it that it's different for us today? How can disruptors and sustainers work together effectively today to achieve social impact in current times? Perhaps we'll go back to Melissa. Thank you. Uh, when I think about the stories of these three founders, it's very clear that all of us who completed college have made a big mistake. <laughs> <laughs> so um, John D. Rockefeller um, collaborated with quite a number of his peers as well as with what public sector institutions uh, did exist. And I'll, I'll just give you a couple of examples. Um, first, he was one of the uh, primary underwriters and supporters of an organization that at the time was called the General Education Board. Um, and he pushed them to help develop uh, part of what would become um, the US public school system. Second, um, he began to recognize um, that there was a need for something which we now call a public health system, but that did not really exist in the United States uh, or in any other part of the world. And he began to offer funds to municipalities, especially in the southern part of the US, which was where the greatest poverty was. Um, but there was a catch. Um, they had to use these funds to start to eradicate disease and to continue to monitor public health. Um, in that instance, I'm not sure that you would call it being a, a collaborator. It was really much more of a threat. But nonetheless, it did create a set of partnerships and relationships. Um, and then finally, uh, the, the third example I would give is that as he started to build some of the flagship institutions that still exist and play an important role um, in the US and around the world, things like uh, what's now called Rockefeller University and the University of Chicago, he was bringing in an idea of what a research institution could be that was very, very foreign to the US. He was a part of a very small group of very forward-looking funders who um, collectively recognized that the research model based at the time in Europe, predominantly in Germany, would have the capacity to transform education and health and how, how physicians were trained. Um, and that is probably the impact that he had that touched the greatest number of lives, was bringing the idea of science into medicine. And I know that sounds uh, odd to say, but in his era, there was not very much science in medicine. And that was a major, major, major disruption and one that he needed to have partners for. Thank you, Melissa. And I've read about um, these uh, collaborations that he had overseas. It was not easy at all, right? He was working across governments and cultures and... And the, the, yeah. the sorts of mechanisms that we take for granted now right. to create partnerships and collaborations uh, didn't really exist. Yeah, so it was not easy during Rockefeller's time too. And Kyung San, how about in Korea? <laughs> Okay, I think I can share one success, one failure, one not yet determined case. <laughs> <laughs> so the successful case was that, like I mentioned before, if he realized his weakness, which is he really didn't learn a lot. So he, even though he sometimes used it as a, his strength that he can do whatever he can by pure belief, but sometimes he really uh, uh, respect the people who did their study. So at the 1970, eight or six or something, sometimes like, actually, 1974. So he started his first foundation, which is Azan Social Welfare Foundation. He realized the problems of the lacking 
uh, medical infrastructure in rural area in Korea. So he started this foundation to support uh, medical care in Korea to provide first very high, very high level uh, medical care to the people and second provide medical care to the rural areas. So this Asan Social Welfare Foundation become the largest foundation and become the top uh, hospital in Korea that provides world class surgeon and everything, especially heart and liver because I think due to the alcohol consumption in Korea, but anyway. <laughs> so, so that is very successful, and then we have medical school and everything, and it is very re well respected, and then he brought this medical level to the next level in Korea, because he know how to delegate this role to the medical professionals and everyone. I guess for the failure cases, uh, so he started this uh, leveraging uh, rural school as a community center. So he uh, he supported some schools in rural area to use their spaces like community center, provide education to the parents, and then gathering the elderly people. All these kind of thing. But the problem was this whole operation or this whole initiative relied on himself a little bit too much, relied on his skinship basically. So everyone followed what he was doing when he was alive, but when he moved on and then no one really followed and then I heard that some other people basically took over this operation and make it to whole other approach and everything and now it's not that functioning well so I guess this is sometimes happening to the disruptor if the disruptor has too strong presence then they really no one really can success it and not yet determined cases basically the uh, his operation or his grand plan with North Korea so when we were in very weird neighborhood situation with North Korea, he started this two business. One is uh, starting a resort or hospitality business in Gungang Mountain area that basically allow the other people to visit North Korea. It's not the really dangerous area that is worthy of visiting, it's really beautiful. And the other thing is he built industrial complex in Gaesong Mountain to uh, provide jobs to the North Korean people and also basically leverage their, play, leverage their uh, lower labor rate for southern companies. But now this both are somewhat jeopardized by the political situation and everything, but our, some of our family members are eager to success his will and his spirit, so we are hoping someday it will be get better and then we really can as what my grandfather hoped, we really can contribute to building trust between North Korea and South Korea. So I guess the th three are some of the cases he did as coordinator. Mm, wonderful. So how about? I think taking the Nanyang University okay. example, there is both success and failure mm -hmm. in the same example. Um, well, the success was coming together and building a university. Mm -hmm. And right. it's collaborating across dialect lines, mm -hmm. you know, Tan Lat was then the chairman of Hokkien Hui Guan. <laughs> Mr. Choi. <Joyce. laughs> Primary mover, he put in five million dollars, can you yeah. imagine 1950s, five yeah. million dollars, how much, how big the money That's was? That's disruptive. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think my grandfather put in a quarter of a million, which was mm. also big money, okay. but Tan Lat Sai was a much bigger businessman mm. in the 1950s. Um, a Teochew working with Hokkien, working with you know, all the, and, and the, the different, different li in those uh, dialect groups yeah. with the Koleo ma masters in the, yeah. still in the background. You know? So that is a, that's remarkable yeah. collaboration across dialect groups, uh, feat, across, yeah. uh, <laughs> which, was, which was a real feat, right? Um, but then they realized that they, after putting all the money together and, and, and constructing the university, they had differences in teaching and, and the quality of the education. So my, my grandfather was of the school that it must be high quality education, whereas there are others in the group, the founders who said, oh no, it must be open to more, must be more inclusive. So rather than more selective, higher quality, have more students you know, and accept a lower quality, um, they couldn't resolve the dispute and, well, they resolved it because my grandfather lost, okay? <laughs> and he left. <laughs> he, so he, he left the, the executive committee and then... And, and Something good came yeah. out of it. But the... And, and thinking back, that was an issue for Nanyang University mm -hmm. later because it meant that the standards of the university was not seen to be as high as it could have been. Mm -hmm. Certainly not, you know, in, 
uh, re re relation to the, to the University of Singapore. So that became one issue because the, the, the civil service you know, and, and some other employers started to pay the Nanyang University, Nanta grads less mm -hmm. because of this reason. Um, so th those were some of the issues of that project. But later on, when U uh, Nanyang University came to, to be merged with uh, University of Singapore to be become NUS, my grandfather came back again and he, uh, because he was seen as, as a person who could bridge both sides of the English-speaking and Chinese-speaking divide, and he chaired the University Council for NUS. So well, that was the next, that's the next, uh, next uh, <laughs> run of <laughs> being involved. Yeah, OK. <laughs> Yeah, let's see. Um, our next question, um, I, I don't know how well to, how to phrase it, but I think it's like, how can sustainers stay relevant amidst development of new approaches, all these disruptions? But I think what we want to put across is that being a sustainer is also as important as being a disruptor. We, we don't just disrupt for the sake of disrupting, you know. Um, uh, maybe the... The, to follow on is just to say, how do disruptors and sustainers know it's time to move on? Like, I think we need to value sustainers a lot because after disruption, it takes a long time to perfect that model. And there might be small little disruptions. Melissa, you wanna, we, we go back to the cycle? <laughs> Shall we make it relevant to today? Yeah, yeah, I think Rather we can. Just going back to history. Yeah. So in a, cer in a certain sense, the way that John D. Rockefeller um, and his wife became the kinds of philanthropists that we think of as sustaining philanthropists was itself actually kind of disruptive. What, what John D. Rockefeller was able to do, which very few of his peers were able or willing to do, was to start organizations and let them go. And, and his willingness to, for example, insist that the University of Chicago needed to have a funding base that would make it sustainable and not have it reliant on the Rockefeller family for the long term was what enabled the University of Chicago to become the powerhouse organization that it is today. The same thing is true of Rockefeller University um, which would not be the only private institution that has, you know, the greatest number of Nobel Prizes around the world if John D. Rockefeller had continued to maintain this as a family institution that the Rockefeller family and only the family controlled and ran. His willingness to let other people come in um, and take an organization in new directions is what has kept all of these organizations um, relevant today. And I think we still see uh, um, situations in which someone who has been a disruptive funder and has created something new won't let go of it. And then, first of all, it's not necessarily sustainable. Second of all, it's, it's backward looking and can't advance uh, with the techniques of the times. And, and so he was not only um, uh, he not only disrupted the usual patterns by letting go of, uh, of institutions, he also let his son, John D. Rockefeller Jr., and, and John D. Rockefeller Jr.'s wife follow their own path to their own disruptions in philanthropy. He didn't mandate that the same issues that he cared about needed to be carried down from generation to generation. And so what he did then was to create a dynasty, so to speak, of disruptors. Um, to be honest, our <laughs> family is not really strong sustainer. <laughs> we are always on the side of disruptor. And so I really cannot give you answers. I'm still struggling with this fighting with this enormous epic battle, battle between disruptor and sustainer because usually <laughs> disruptor, they take a little bit too much pleasure of breaking rules <laughs> to do whatever they want to do. And sustainer, they usually confused and lost and cry if the rule is broken and something unexpected happens. So, <laughs> so I guess as long as you have very, uh, so disruptor, as long as you have very clear vision and mission and then you somehow know how to communicate why you're doing this to your successor, which is sustainer, then sustainer will 
make it much more clearer than that, and then they'll just keep replicated and replicated and replicated. And I guess this will be ideal scenario. But usually, so if the disruptor they are not good at communicating, then sustainer only looks the very outside of it, and then they just assume that this is certain kind of things to follow, and they're a little bit scared of this disruptor, so they just really mm -hmm. don't want to ask what the actually this mm. disruption is about. So they are sometimes just took a shell, only the shell, and then they just mm. repeated it. So that's why sometimes this really great organization, once the disruptor had, becomes very bureaucratic organization after some time. So I guess how to how to make this disruptor to communicate his vision and mission more clearly would be, I guess, critical to be this, to help sustainable to be relevant of mm -hmm. what they're doing. And I've been doing my things for only five to, uh, three to five years, so I don't know. I never had this moving on <laughs> moment right now. I don't want to move on for another maybe four decades, I guess. Right. So good, good, good. I guess Thank I'll you. give you that yeah. answer. I guess if we are interested in the long term and we are interested in impact and being a change agent, you need you clearly need both disruptors and sustainers. Yeah. Um, in, in the ecosystem. And although, I mean, the foundation, I mean, the foundation is known for innovative new models and doing things radically and being disruptive, mm -hmm. right? Um, but at the back of our minds, it's always, you know, what is the exit? You know, what is the long term going to look like? And the answer is different for different types of projects. You know, so, so some projects that you do is a proof of concept that it, you know if it succeeds, people will look at it and say, oh, this sort of thing can be done, and they'll go and copy. And if they copy, that's the best form of you know, flattery, but it means that it will get sustained by somebody else because they're copying it. Um, so for example, I mean, we're building a, a nursing home now in, with the Salvation Army that is not something that this, we have seen in Singapore. We can read about it you know, in, on, on our website. Um, but we know that if it can be done, others will, will copy and we want people to copy. Mm -hmm. But there are also certain things that we do that you have to be in it for the long term because change is difficult and tough. You're cha trying to change culture and if you don't do it, nobody else would. So, I mean, we are very into end of life issues and we set up the Yen Center for Palliative Care and we're trying to transform, I suppose, the way that um, uh, doctors, uh, the medical profession looks at end-of-life issues and trying to train them in the practice of palliative care, palliative medicine. We are in this for the long term. I mean, you can't just start a capacity building program that is for a few doctors, you know, and then say that the work is finished, but if we re-exit, who else is going to do it, right? Um, and we know that hopefully we will be out of a job maybe in 10 years, 20 years, but because the, the university is doing a much better job training the younger people, but the old ones will, mm -hmm. will exit. But until then, I mean, we're going to be in it. You know, Lien A, the work that we do for water and sanitation that we started with NTU, yeah. again, I mean, it's not something that you're going to solve the water and sanitation problems of, of the region no. just in three years or four years with some innovative models. Right. You know? No, I mean, we are in it for the long term. You need uh, good sustainers. And you need, and, and there are people who are, who, who like to be sustainers, right? So in change, we need all to come together. Uh, even in disruption, some disruptions are so big that you, you, you need several funders to de-risk it, you know, so forth, or so that you can have more, mm. uh, so that you can dream bigger, not, not, right? You know, for example, the, 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 the Jade Circle, which is this innovative nursing home, um, we're only putting in 40% of the funding for the project as a Lien Foundation mm -hmm. because another 40% comes from another funder, an, uh, a, a, a philanthropist, and, th and the rest comes from <coughs> the NGO. Yeah. Uh, if we don't have the collaboration, then the project, again, will be <coughs> too, either too big for us to take on or we will have to be skilled back. So I think if you want to, even if you want to disrupt, you, will, you have to come together to work together. Right. 
Wonderful, thank you. We're going to have the last set of questions for the panel, and then we'll move to Q and A. Now, this last set of questions will be different questions for each of you. So. So Melissa, the first one is, um, you work with a um, diverse pool of donors at RPA. Um, can you tell us what are the trends that, are, that you see with the donors or investees, uh, investors that you work with? I'd like to know sure. what are people doing and thinking these days? Sure, I think some of the trends that we've been observing over the last few years in our work, uh, we really see emerging all around the globe, and I think in uh, in part, that's because we really have seen the emergence in the past five, 10 years of a global culture of giving. Um, as um, people who are leaders in their fields, uh, whether it's in business or philanthropy or, or other areas, are incre increasingly part of a global network. So I'd say that some of the trends that we're seeing most strongly, first, I think, uh, people who have uh, capacity to make social change happen are getting involved in this much, much earlier in their lives. For many prior generations, uh, philanthropy, social investing, social change was something that they did as almost the last chapter of their lives, either at the very end of their lives or literally after their death uh, when they left bequests and established uh, charitable organizations as part of their wills. But now we see people getting involved much, much earlier in their life, bringing their family in from the very beginning. I think second, uh, people are uh, interested in trying to make big bets to tackle big problems. Uh, and as Lawrence, Lawrence mentioned, that leads inevitably to collaboration because nobody is big enough to do it on their own. I think a third trend and something that's a very, you know, the real focus of this particular event is that there are new ways to use financial resources to make change happen in society. And whether that is funding social entrepreneurs, uh, impact investing, or uh, using financial resources to increase awareness, um, advocacy, um, and to try and build a coalition for change, all of those techniques are quite different from the way philanthropy was typically uh, practiced. And then I think the last piece of it is that for many uh, people who are concerned about social change, they are also concerned about their legacy. Um, if you go back to the example of John D. Rockefeller, the first, I, I hinted that some of his business methods were not really well regarded. Um, he was, for a good, good part of his career, uh, reviled by the general public. Um, if you look up Robber Baron in the dictionary, his picture <laughs> is there. And he was also under a great deal of pressure from the U.S. government, which successfully brought suit against his company um, uh, under antitrust provisions. Uh, ironically, that made him richer, but um, I think now many people look at what they've achieved and what they want their legacy to be and what they want their family to be known by and what they want their children to uh, grasp as part of their values is a, a commitment to having impact in the world. Okay, for Kyung San, I want to ask you, one year ago sitting here at the last ABPN, um, you told us about your project at Root Impact, um, how you're going to build all the housing for social entrepreneurs. Uh, and that time it was just on, on paper. Give us an update. I'm excited about your project. Okay, so I was here last year at April and then I declared that I'll do something crazy for, <laughs> for the next couple years, uh, which is we are trying to create private-led social impact cluster in Seoul that provides housing and office and retail spaces to the either social entrepreneur or the nonprofit to increase their impact, basically. So at that time, we only purchased the one property, so it was about like $3 million investment at the time. But now we have, uh, now the fund, or the investment, it grows into $25 million. And then now we have uh, housing for 30 change makers working for either social enterprise or nonprofit organization around this area. And we provide office to 20 nonprofit organizations 
and social enterprises, and including our uh, friends organization, it'll, it goes up to like 30. And total, it's about 300 people working in this 10 minutes walking distance, basically. And also, we have two restaurants, which is uh, both uh, have social function, which is either hiring marginalized youth or helping local small farmers to grow organic foods, basically. And now, by next year, November or December, December will open center. The name is Ground, and it'll be a social enterprise center for about 60,000 square feet. There will be about about 400 to 500 people working there, and we hope it will be very good um, landmark for this area to represent that actually this private people can do this kind of social cluster in Seoul. So it is quite exciting, and I, I'm really sorry for not prepare any visual presentation this year. <laughs> Maybe next year I'll prepare more visual presentation here and there. So it's quite exciting. Wonderful, and you're building this ecosystem. Yes, I guess I found my passion in real estate. Yep. Fantastic. Mm -hmm. And to Lawrence, tell us about your latest disruption that you have at APC. <laughs> Not yet disruptive. <laughs> <laughs> Planning to be, but only just got started uh, beginning of this minutes. year. <laughs> okay, five minutes. Um, well, I don't have that much anyway to, to say <laughs> because it's, uh, we, we are looking at mobilizing philanthropists, as I mentioned, uh, mm -hmm. among the larger donors. This group, you know, someone said, oh, you want to network philanthropists and get them to work together, that's like herding cats. And I said, well, OK, at least uh, I like cats, you know, so I'll, I'll, I'll keep at it. <laughs> um, and, and the idea is that, well, if you want to create change and create impact, um, you can only do that if, if people start working together. Uh, because many of the social problems that we have are too complex for any one person to go alone. So we're looking for like-minded philanthropists from around the region, only targeting a very small group, you know, maybe perhaps 100 uh, in the steady state, not, not this year. Um, very different, I think, in, in, in very niche and focus compared to AVPN, which is much more broad-based and, and much more an umbrella for, for venture philanthropy, um, and trying to put them into groups to start working on key themes that resonate with each of them. Mm -hmm. uh, well, first of all, we need to get a membership first, so I will mm -hmm. report to you next year when, <laughs> <Report>. <laughs> okay. when uh, we, we are more further along in terms of the membership as well. As, I'm interested as to, to know, mm -hmm. because you talked about um, how it's not easy to identify mm -hmm. that this is what you want to do. We have the tools, but the cause, how did you come about mm -hmm. figuring out that this is the gap and this is where I want to do? And I'm going to move this along. Well, everybody is going to have a different way of arriving at that. Uh, yeah. But hopefully, it's got something that is, is a piece that, I mean, a piece that you choose to tackle that personally resonates with you, with what you call the, gives you private value, and what is good for society, what has got public value, mm -hmm. right? No, don't do something that has got no public value <laughs> and nobody cares about or, or is really unimportant. Yeah. Uh, so what's the confluence between the two? You know, and that's, that's the space that you want to work at. Wonderful. Thank you, all three of you, for sharing um, from your founders to what you're doing today. Uh, I think we're going to open up for Q&A at this point. There's two mics on each side. Oh, two minutes. You can come out and uh, tell us your question. Tell us where you're from. And if you want to direct the question to a specific person on the panel, or if it is a general question, open to all. Well, come on, be the first to the disruptor. Yeah, we have one here. Can you go to the mic? Um, anyone with questions, you can line up at the mic and uh, wait for them. Good afternoon. Very interesting presentations. Thank you very much. I'm Duncan McIntosh from the Information Society Innovation Fund, East of Asia Pacific. I'm interested to get the panel thoughts on the new initiative from new philanthropists to disperse their wealth within their lifetimes? I, I think I can anticipate the response, but I'm interested still to hear what the panel thinks of the relevance and impact of that initiative. Thank you. So wealth redistribution within their lifetimes. 
So, um, the Thank you. Um, excellent question. Um, the trend toward giving while living, um, we're seeing a great deal of that. And I think it's driven uh, in part by something I mentioned earlier, the increasing um, willingness of many philanthropists to want to make big bets. And they look at the matter um, and uh, that they're trying to address, and they're often coming to the conclusion that a lot of money over a short period of time can create much more sustainable change than a smaller amount of money over a much longer period of time. And to some extent, that depends on what issue you're trying to address and what the ecosystem of funding is. Um, we're sort of neutral on whether one should or should not do that. It's a personal choice, and it's really uh, a very situational. But for many donors, it's also a matter of wanting to have uh, control over how their resources are used. They're not happy with the idea that uh, two generations from now, um, their successors may have a completely different vision. And whether that's a smart way to think or not, I think the jury is kind of out on that. But the idea that um, you can have more of an impact by concentrating your resources is very appealing to many people. Well, it's, it's appealing to me, but to convince the other family members is a lot harder, you know? Uh, <laughs> and usually on decisions like this, the more conservative ones will, will win. Okay. I see. What about your family? Well, Actually, I have a similar question because I guess in some Asian culture that children are expected to success their family business and everything. So basically, someone's money is not his own, not his money. So his or her money. It's also family's money and children's money. So sometimes I watch this fight between the father and child that father gave his money to someplace else and donated, and children said, why are you giving my money to them? So I guess <laughs> it has lots of interesting family dynamics and everything, so I, I guess I want to see how people will overcome this thing. Yeah. And in Asia, sometimes even if it's your money, they say, no, it's not your money, it's the family's money, <laughs> right? So working with Asian donors or investors is a little bit different. <laughs> Okay, we have a question? Yes, a uh, question. Yeah, thank you very much for all of you. Marina, you are just excellent to manage these three in a very right way. My question to Lorenz um, regarding your Asia Philanthropy Circle, I think that's what Marina just said. It's so important now to engage and to educate Asian donors. And how you actually, just briefly, how you are planning to do that. Yeah, thank you. Um, well, we, we plan to do it in, in different ways. One is uh, at the individual level with the families and, 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 and um, the members um, that we will offer quite customized sort of advice that is uh, that's available to, to them. Um, but most of it is going to be peer driven. I mean, uh, we are looking at uh, philanthropists who have got experience rather than those who are starting out and trying to figure out. Um, so with the experience and with the willingness to share, I mean, we are not going to attract people who have got huge egos and who don't like listening. You know, <laughs> you have to put your egos at the door um, and be willing and have that collaborative mindset. Um, then more and more we want to move towards a peer-driven sort of platform where, where uh, the, the sharing and the learning is from one another. Uh, but I mean, the, the Secretariat would, would definitely facilitate uh, uh, the learning and also the connection to the best uh, practices on the ground. But uh, the, the learning is really by doing too, you know, and that, therefore, uh, for us, uh, we cannot emphasize this more. I mean, if we judge our record 10 years from today, whether we've done well, and if no action can be attributed to the work of the circle, we are a failure, and then we should just shut down. Okay, um, and, and we're very serious about that. Uh, so, how how do we intentionally catalyze that? And and together, we we, we learn by doing. Learn by doing. To get together, yeah. Any other questions? Oh, yeah, we have one here. Two. Okay. Oh. Feel free to line up behind, so we know that how, who's who's got questions. 
Hello, my name is Michael Magnaya. I'm with the National Council on Crime and Delinquency. We're based in San Francisco, California. Um, we, are work, we are an intermediary working with a pay for success um, instrument with the federal government of the United States and re-granting it. My question is, um, if you can share experiences around private or pub, private public or public private, wherein private philanthropy works with the government, whether it's the state, federal, or local government in the United States, in Korea, or locally in Singapore. Um, if there are any models that you can share wherein um, you work with the government um, as opposed to having it as two separate entities, that it's just the government's job or it's just the private philanthropist's job. So share those kinds of synergies. Thank you. Jump in first. So, especially after when we started this local creating social cluster initiative, we are getting calls from a lot of the municipal government and then the, the local government and the politicians and everyone because this is about uh, no, revitalizing your community with not that many money, basically. So they love our idea and then they, they love this young people trying something new in that their idea, so they are actively looking for a private-public partnership with us. So I guess the government has the lots of potential and resources to do something big, and private, usually they have contents to how to leverage that big monies, but I guess this will only works if you have private people who has enough patient <laughs> waiting for the government people to actually go through all these papers and bureaucrats and everything and then it, I, I figure that it has has to be that way because this is not their money this is not some people's money this is everyone's money so they have to make um, compromise every time and then they have to make consensus every time so it will take time so as long as the private partners have this kind of endurance and patient then it will be my to work and also for the government uh, I'm not sure about other country, but in Korea, you cannot stay for, uh, as a government agency, you cannot stay in one uh, department for more than, I think, two years or three years. So, so they're rotating every time, which means they have no idea what is going on right now. And then when, once they get to know what is going on, and then they have to move to another department. So usually it's working that way. So we need very strong-minded uh, I guess higher ranking official to push certain agenda even though that he knows that he might not able to get the result from it and that is uh, and willing to take a risk as a government to give private partner to enough room to do whatever they can do and whatever they are good at so I guess this kind of very delicate and also hard negotiation is needed for a successful private public partnership and quite Quite often, if you really want scale and impact, you need to work with government. Mm -hmm. But <laughs> if you work with government, you need to have a pretty high threshold of pain. <laughs> Tenacity. <laughs> Tenacity, resilience, and so on, because it can be really, really <laughs> difficult. Sometimes it works very well. You know, uh, so one example is uh, for, for Lian Foundation, we are doing end-of-life issues, and that somehow is an area that the Singapore government doesn't want to touch because it's really a taboo topic, too sensitive. If they touch it, they know that people will say, oh, you want me to die faster, you know? <laughs> that's why, to, to save you know, public finances, you know? That's, that's why you're yeah. you know, promoting this area. Um, so what they did was to outsource the... Uh, we set up the Lien Center for Palliative Care, which I mentioned just now, and they've commissioned, the Ministry of Health commissioned the center to do the national blueprint for palliative care for the country. And that was like really mm -hmm. never been done before where, the, where uh, you know, uh, a non-profit initiated center is doing this for the country. Uh, but we know that they, why they're doing it, huh? because uh, they can't be seen to be fronting it. Sometimes it's really painful. I mean, I, just quite recently, I won't mention the agency, so I, I won't mention the issue, because otherwise you, will, you can identify the agency. Now, we went to an agency, government agency, and said, well, we've got this research idea that will study the field. Um, and they went away, and they came back and said, well, good idea, but we won't go with you. We'll do exactly the same thing with our own consultant. 
Oh, exactly the same thing. Or we add it to the work that we were on consultant, and we're like, then we don't, then our own consultant, we have to say, goodbye, sorry, yeah. because they're going to do it. Um, <laughs> you had great success with the hmm? preschool sector. You, were, yeah. you managed to rally and in some way... Well, I mean, we, ra we rallied the, the yeah. preschool sector, but I mean, that was maybe fortuitous in the sense that the government was already ready to move. I, okay, I, so my suspicion, I, I, don't, I don't know. You, you can be advocating in the sector and you may be doing great things, but the, the government is sure not going to give you credit for it you know, in most countries because okay. they need to win elections. Um, so you don't know how much you influence, really, but uh, you like to think that you were the tipping you know, the ones who, who tipped it over, you know, to, to make it acceptable. Yeah, or, you kicked the brick and, and, and the brick moved a little bit. That's good. <laughs> but certainly when we advocated for preschool education, the government moved. You know, yeah, yeah. Cause and effect, I don't know. We've got to ask the policymakers. How about Melissa in the US? Yeah. So I'll give you just a couple of US examples um, of um, uh, philanthropic projects that we've uh, been involved with. One uh, uh, in San Francisco, um, there's a lot of interest, as you know, in developing alternative sources of energy to fossil fuels. And the, uh, the mayor of uh, San Francisco at the time was interested in the idea of whether uh, San Francisco could harness the power of the tide as it moves in and out of the bay. Please don't ask any detailed questions about <laughs> how that might work. I believe the answer is magic. <laughs> and, but because this is an unproven idea that most people could not understand or explain, politically for many governments, municipal governments, that's a risky thing for them to try and use government funding for. But what the public-private partnership that developed was that the Sydney Frank Foundation made a grant to uh, the city of San Francisco to try and test this idea. So they put up the highest risk capital um, and they put it up actually not as an impact investment with no sense of return, but as a donation to try and create proof of concept. And then when the idea turned out to work, then all of a sudden investors, the local utility, as well as public funds could all rally around it and find a way to get it funded as an investable idea. But that first piece that of where everybody is standing around and looking and no one is comfortable or able to take the first step, that's often where philanthropy can come into play. So the other example is one that's more of a mixed result. Um, a donor in New York named Lori Tisch um, uh, was talking to some people in the New York State Health Department. And one of the big challenges that many large urban areas have is that people who live in poor neighborhoods have very limited access to good quality and affordable fruits and vegetables. They, it just is very, very difficult. And so the idea was, well, every city has food carts. Why don't we create a set of food carts that will have fresh fruits and vegetables We'll get a bulk purchasing deal. The city can help negotiate that. And they'll take those carts and sell fruits and vegetables in neighborhoods that don't have ready access to them. And private philanthropy was helpful because, again, there were certain startup costs that a municipal government has trouble with. Um, so helping to train the vendors of how to uh, sell fresh fruits and vegetables when maybe they were used to selling, you know, sausages um, and, and uh, pretzels. That was a challenge that private philanthropy could help with, helping to physically design the carts, not something that many municipal governments could fund. The challenge was um, the, the donor asked the, govern the government for a sort of plan of how this was going to operate. And even though this had never been tried anywhere else in the world, uh, somebody in the health department of New York City said, well, in uh, 18 months, we'll have 1,000 carts out on the streets. And within three years, we'll see um, improved health in these neighborhoods. That was not a promise that they could deliver on. And, and that's an example of where um, governments are probably used to be able to declare what the results are going to be, but when they're doing experiments, 
they really have to resist the idea of coming up with artificially determined uh, output and outcome measures. Thank you. I think we had someone um, wanting to ask, yeah. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, I'm Devi Hutabharat from uh, Synergy Indonesia. Uh, picking up from the last question and the uh, uh, last note from the speaker, especially from Melissa, Melissa uh, is this uh, trial or uh, nobody's willing to touch kind of experiments is also applied to a sort of a process, not any kind of technology, no, nothing to do with, you know, like that, but it's a process. Like, for example, in uh, just to give a, a little bit of a, a description, a more description is in Synergy Indonesia is trying to uh, encourage more uh, synergy, multi-stakeholders in the society to uh, el uh, for poverty alleviation in Indonesia. And one of the uh, assumption or uh, study that we have made uh, uh, make us believe that one of the key thing is uh, the, the, the lacking is the synergy among the multi-stakeholders and uh, multi-sectors. So, uh, and then we see that uh, we need some what we call as a system integrator in the society or in a community that uh, it makes it possible to glue uh, the multi-sectors and allowing the process to take place. And we see in Indonesia especially uh, that university can take that role as a system integrator in its respective community to allow government and private and uh, to sit NGOs and all that to sit down together and uh, see how we resolve the uh, community problems and poverty especially in a multi-dimensional uh, uh, perspective, uh, not only sectorals. Uh, so, uh, but that is a sort of disruptive kind of process that is not yet uh, proven to be working on the society, but we believe that it has to take place. So it, this kind of uh, process that is newly, uh, re, uh, just newly uh, th thought is not proven, is it also applied? Thank you very much. Well, it's a tough one because I don't think we see good examples, of good models of uh, multi-sector collaboration efforts you know, that involves the different stakeholders from the different sectors working on, on issues together. I, I like to see that. I think it's important. Mm -hmm. um, but, but I like to see it more focused on specific issues rather than it being too broad because I think you start losing uh, people, uh, focus, people attend and people will stop coming. Um, and that on specific issues, if you can get the different stakeholders coming together, you know, the government, NGOs, private sector, relevant private sector people, or interested private sector people, philanthropists, and so on, um, discussing those issues in a deliberative way so that, and creating a, a collective vision for the future. Uh, some people call this collective impact, you know, that, that's, that, you, that you drive, the, the action to to, uh, to its logical conclusions, where different people decide to to do different parts, to tackle different parts of the problem in a coordinated way, such that the impact you see as one, mm -hmm. rather than each maximizing their own objective function. I think uh, that there are good examples from the U.S. Maybe Melissa. Uh, can, can, can I, I'll give one example of where I think it did not work so well and one example that I'm kind of optimistic on. So um, one of the kinds of uh, disruptive innovations that President Obama tried to develop in his first term uh, was the idea that the US government should be able to fund social innovation, to be able to fund some of these kinds of disruptions that all of you are involved in and that you know I've loved learning so much about over the last two days. But a government is very hard, hard pressed because of who its constituents are, to put a bet on something where the outcome isn't certain. So the social innovation fund was set up, and the idea was you could come to it with an innovative solution that had already been proved. So this is not really exactly what we were hoping for. So that's not so good. Um, the 
the idea that I'm a little more optimistic about is um, a, a collaborative that involves some major foundations, uh, the Ford Foundation, the Hilton Foundation, the MasterCard Foundation, as well as other funders around the world, um, trying to create a platform for uh, philanthropy and civil society to engage with the UN around the sustainable development goals, the ones that are sort of the next wave after the Millennium Development Goals. And those are a series of kinds of events and dialogues that have been held in uh, places like Jakarta, in, in uh, Bogota, Colombia, uh, in Kenya, um, and are coming to lots of other countries around the world, and, and lots of different stakeholders are coming here, and it is exactly the model that Lawrence is talking about, because these sustainable development goals don't belong to any one player. Everyone can kind of uh, come together to support them and to find what their own voice in them will be. Okay, do we have any more questions? You don't see any more questions? Now, if you don't have any more questions, I'd like to wrap up, but I'd like to share um, two of, I think I have a, uh, some thoughts I'd like to share too. I've been to ABPN for like three years, four years, three years, maybe four, because I came when you started in the workshop. Um, I noticed that it has really improved a lot on the mechanism and the tools. I think what um, and I hear a lot of uh, you're talking about how when you go down to the ground, it's so different. I hear today, listen, um, flexible, be flexible when, when you're on the ground, although your plan is like that. I think I don't hear, what I don't hear is people celebrating small steps. And I think even if you're the investor, if your grantee has made a small step, try to encourage them by celebrating with them because it is only through small steps you will get there. And for if you're an investee or a grantee, if you have something that, is, um, that you want to share with your grantor or your investor, I don't think you need to wait until the full report at the end, then you write up the whole report and it's also mechanical. I think at the end of the day, whether you're doing venture philanthropy, impact investing, it is still philanthropy. And giving is emotional. So I think we need to put a little bit more of the emotional back on two sides, both sides. Invest, the, the investees are doing very hard work on the ground, so occasionally you have to pat on their backs. If they have made the, the uh, you know, a, a slight move that is an improvement over yesterday or last week, say thank you to them. I think there needs to be a little bit more gratitude and um, appreciation for one another. If you feel that your program has, has something great happened to one of your constituents, send a note to your, your donor or your investor. Let them know yesterday it was so great. The family that you were support, you know, the family that was in this program made a move that was so positive. Because at the end of the day, they're all humans also. I think they need to be able to feel the impact other than reading about the impact. That was, that's just my personal observation, and um, to that, any more, anything you want to say? And I think we can wrap up and go for dinner, right? <laughs>